Hey everybody, you're with the American Battlefield Trust and here we are on the Shiloh National Military Park. This is a series of videos we're doing, at least the third or fourth Shiloh video we've done. Maybe it's fifth or sixth already and we've already covered Forts Henry and Donaldson. So make sure you go back and watch the others. Make sure you share this with your friends so as many people can understand and respect American history just a little bit more. And when you come onto battlefields, a lot of people see fences and they see cannons and that's a national military park. But you also see stacked cannon barrels. You see, uh, 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 I'm sorry, stack cannon balls, and then you also see cannon barrels, sometimes pointing up, sometimes pointing down. Parker Hills, our good friend, General, is a good supporter of the Trust, Battle Focus Tours. What are we looking at, and why do they stack these things? Gary, these are mortuary monuments. Uh, we've got uh, inverted 20-pounder parrot rifle barrels sticking straight up, and we've got stacked balls. And th there are five of these mortuary monuments showing where significant personnel were killed on the battlefield. Uh, we've, uh, we've got three generals. We've got Albert Sidney Johnston, the Confederate General, uh, Brigadier General Adley Gladden, the Confederate General. We've got General, uh, 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 general W.H.L. Wallace, who was killed here, Union General. And then we've got two colonels here. We've got Colonel Julius Reif, and we've got uh, Colonel Everett Peabody, and this is the Peabody's monument we're seeing here. It's here that Peabody will, will be dressed down by his boss, Benjamin Mayberry Prentice, for starting on this fight, as because it was Peabody who sent out Major Powell's reconnaissance, who detected the Confederates at Fraley Field, and was really the tripwire for the Union Army. So if there is a hero at the Battle of Shiloh, and this man's limited opinion, it's Everett Peabody. This is the man who saved basically the Union Army from total surprise early on the Sunday morning of 6th of April, 1862. But uh, Peabody will be struck several times by many balls after being dressed down by, many, by Prentice saying, I'm going to hold you responsible for this. And Peabody says, I'm always responsible for what I do. Peabody is leading his men to try to repel the Confederate attack. Uh, he's wounded several times, but the last one is a fatal wound. A mini ball enters right above the t his top lip and comes out the back of his head, and Peabody is no more. Uh, so uh, Peabody will uh, initially be buried on the battlefield, but uh, after, the, after the battle is over, he, his body will be removed and taken and back home. This is one of the mortuary monuments here. And I think you all understand this. Civil War combat is deadly, and the course of the Civil War did not encourage, you know, colonels and brigadiers especially to lead from the back. If anything, they had to, you know, sort of demonstrate and sometimes, as they called it, recklessly expose themselves to danger in order to do their job, to inspire their troops. And people often want to know, you know, when I go to a cemetery and I see a stone on it or there's a monument in that cemetery, what does that mean? And they want to go to a national military park and see an upright cannon barrel and understand what that is. And the fact is, in most of these cases, the parks and the cemeteries don't talk to one another. There are no general, there are no specific rules. And this is why you need battlefield guides to help you sort it all out. Because if you go to Gettysburg and see an upright cannon barrel, that's a major general's headquarters or higher. If you go to Antietam and see a downward pointing cannon barrel, that is a mortuary cannon. There are six over there. If you go to uh, Chickamauga and see stack cannonballs, they mean dis something different than the stack cannonballs here in whatnot. So you've got to, you know, you really have to understand your park at an individual level. And now without any warning, because I threatened to do so, I'm going to grab the camera from Chris Mikowski and I'm going to ambush Parker and Chris with a little bit of middle name trivia. Oh no, <laughs> oh, no. Middle names already. So here we go. We're going to start out a little bit er, uh, easy. Nathan Forrest. Bedford. All right. William Rosecrans. Start. Uh, this one's not I'm, fair. I'm going so quick because I'm going to hey, run out of hey, ones hey, I know. Going too quick for me. <laughs> Um, uh, hey, this old, this old man doesn't think that fast. This one's not even fair. Earl Dorn. <laughs> Earl Van Dorn. <laughs> Van. All right, Pierre Beauregard. Toutant. All right. Gustav Toutant. Gustav Toutant. 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 All right, a little harder. Samuel D. Sturgis. Davis. All right, good. See, I told uh, you I would start running out. All right, <laughs> William J. Hardy. I guess mm. that's going to be a James. Yeah. James? Yeah, try the second one. Joseph. Joseph? Oh, William okay. Joseph, there you go. All right, uh, William H. L. Wallace. Oh, you William Harvey one. Lamb Wallace. Benjamin Prentice. Mayberry. All right, good. How about John A. McClernand? Alexander. All right, I, I don't think I need to. Oh, well. <laughs> Thomas L. Crittenden. Oh, and I should know this one. Um, it's, I, it's related to Polk here. Oh, Leonidas? Leonidas, oh, yeah. Le, yeah. Yeah, Leon, Leonidas. All right, this is the last one I'll hit you with, okay? How about this? Presidential, John B. Floyd. John B. John Floyd. B. Floyd. I gave worst, you a hint. The worst man ben to ever Benjamin? don a uniform. No. 
Uh, John B. Floyd. <laughs> wow, that says oh, a lot. Oh, yeah, wow. The worst man, in my opinion, to ever die in a uniform. I think General Listen. Ledley, oh, who didn't die, I guess. Okay, you're right. Buchanan. 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 Oh, okay. Yes, Buchanan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, worst man to wear the presidential uniform. So there. Was, <laughs> so, but I have a question before we wrap up. And then, Gary, I'm going to get the camera and bring you back on here so that both of you can answer this. Because Parker said a second ago that, um, in his humble opinion, Peabody is the hero of this battle. And yet, one of the popular myth, uh, myths of this battle is that Prentiss holding the hornet's net saves the Union because he holds on to that line. <laughs> Why is it we think that Prentiss, not Peabody, is the hero of this. And Gary, I know you have some things to say, so as I switch camera, uh, why do you think that we have that misconception? Well, remember, uh, dead men tell no tales. Uh, every Peabody's gone. Benjamin Mayberry Prentiss will take credit for sending out this combat patrol when he realizes that this, after the battle is over with, remember, he's captured at the hornet's nest, and after he's paroled, he's somewhat of a hero. Um, and he writes the history. He tells the history, and he leaves Peabody out. He doesn't even mention him by name in his after-action report. Uh, that's what I call throwing a fellow officer, particularly a dead fellow officer, under the bus. Uh, and uh, so it's not until the official records are being compiled and the reports are compiled and Powell's report and other reports come out that, that, uh, that Prentice has learned to be basically a liar. Uh, and so for 25 to 30 years, Prentice is the hero of Shiloh, and even today, many historians will fall for that trap. Uh, and to me, he's a villain of Shiloh. I know if, uh, if there is such a thing as a villain of Shiloh, uh, I would rather talk about the hero of Shiloh, and I think that's Everett Peabody. And, you know, and I'll make him a further villain here. I don't think he only threw Peabody under the bus. He also sort of threw Wallace under the bus. You know, Wallace yeah, was Peabody. doing a lot of the hard fighting um, over near what we call the Hornet's Nest. And I'm going to add something else here. I would say that Prentice, who did live and lived for a little while, as I remember, and came back to this battlefield, was also significantly bolstered by the park's first historian. I forget, his, I think his name is Wood, but he fought at the Hornet's Nest. I think he's in the 12th Iowa, if that unit is there. Um, and I, he is there, and that Battle of Shiloh, that was his experience, and he places, as the park's first historian, he places the Hornet's Nest at the center of it. This is the place where we held on long enough to allow Grant to establish another line. This is the place without which there would never been an opportunity to lick them tomorrow. So, you know, it's real interesting. I couldn't, I couldn't support more, though, that history is written by winners who live, okay? The Union won this battle. They got to tell this story, and that story will be told by people who are around to tell it. It seems obvious, but a lot of people don't think about that with history. Well, I'll say it often. Uh, the first guy who gets it wrong, everybody footnotes him. <laughs> I'm not going to try to top that. Thanks, as always, so much, Parker Hills. That's Chris Lukowski uh, behind the camera, as you've already seen. I'm Gary Edelman for the American Battlefield Trust. Thank you for joining us on this video. Share it with your friends, and thank you, as always, for supporting battlefield preservation and education.